Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. But really what the quality allows us to do is to have an explicit conversation about how we're spending healthcare resources, what type of health gain or the amount of health gain we're getting from them, and to be really explicit about what are the benefits and the burdens of our healthcare spending. I'm your host, Alan Weil. The quality adjusted life year, known amongst us in healthcare as a quality, combines the expected effects on longevity and the expected effects on quality of life into a single standard measure. Now, qualities are often used as part of cost effectiveness analysis, particularly when analyzing the effectiveness of drugs. The quality has received a lot of criticism. It's been criticized in concept, in the specifics of how it's defined or used, and that criticism often forms the basis for opposition to price negotiations or any limitations on access to a particular drug. This kind of criticism can make it particularly difficult to reach consensus on processes that might yield negotiated or regulated prices. The varied types of criticism of the quality and how to respond to them is the topic of today's health policy. I'm here with Leah Rand, a postdoctoral fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital. In a paper in the September 2021 issue of Health Affairs, Dr. Rand and co-author Dr. Aaron Kesselheim conduct a systematic literature review of critiques of qualities and their relevance to drug health technology assessment. They identify three main categories of ethical and practical critiques of qualities. They are methodological concerns, criticisms of neutrality, and potential discrimination. And the authors conclude that understanding and addressing criticism of the quality is essential for the move to value-based pricing. Dr. Rand, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks for joining me. So I'm not sure everyone who's listening has heard of a quality. Let's start with the basics. What is a quality-adjusted life year? What is taken into account when calculating a quality? Well, you did a great job in the intro setting up what a quality is and that it's this standardized health economic outcome measure for measuring the net health benefit of an intervention, like a prescription drug. And it combines the effect of the drug on mortality or length of life and also on morbidity or health-related quality of life. So it's accounting for both quantity and quality of life. And so to calculate a quality, The time spent in a health state is multiplied by a utility score, utility weighting, for that health state. That's the quality adjusting bit. And the utilities range from zero for dead to one for living in full health. And health states for everything in between are assigned these different weighting scores. So as an example, um, if dialysis is assigned a utility weighting score of 0.8 because of the burdens of being on dialysis, someone who's on dialysis for 10 years, um, when we compare that treatment with dialysis compared to, say, no treatment, we'd say that it's resulted in eight qualities, 10 times 0.8. So it's this quality is giving us this way to calculate the difference in health between no treatment or standard of care compared to the intervention of interest, how much it extends life by, and how we weight it for quality of life. Um, And of course, over time, people experience different health states, maybe with treatment, their health is declining. We can break up that time into shorter durations and find the qualities for each one, weighting the time spent in the health state by the utility for that health state, and then summing them together to get the total qualities gained. Um, So there are really two key components when we think about the methods of qualities that are that how we measure health states and how to arrive at the utilities that should be assigned to each health state. Yeah, so I just want to touch on that briefly here. Uh, you mentioned a 0.8 weighting. Those numbers aren't pulled out of a hat. You give us a sense of where those utility weights come from. So the utility weightings are this idea that we should people have preferences about um, the state in which they live their lives and their their quality of lives. And the utility weightings come from large surveys that are done of the public or of patients that use tools that try to get at their preferences for different types of health states. So one of those tools is called the time trade-off, and it presents people with alternative scenarios and asks which one they would prefer. So for example, they might be asked, they could live the rest of their lives in full health, but it would be shorter, 
or they could live with a certain impaired health state, but for a longer amount of time. And by getting at how much full health people are willing to forgo in order to avoid a worse health state, we start to reveal what their preferences are. And that becomes the basis of the utility score. There are also other methods like the standard gamble that plays with different levels of uncertainty and risk that people are willing to take to avoid a particular health state. And that's another way of getting at their preferences and then the utilities that are assigned to those health states. Can you just take us back to, to the origin of the quality, uh, why it was created and where is it mostly used today? So the concept of the quality was first developed in the 1960s by economists and psychologists who were looking for ways to measure health and how people value health. Um, and the word quality adjusted life here, the phrase first appeared in the literature in 1976. And the challenge that these economists faced were questions like which healthcare program should be invested in? Should a hospital expand its capacity for cardiology procedures or its radiology suite? And one way to answer that type of question is to consider which option would result in more health. But then how do you compare all of the different types of outcomes that follow from each of these interventions um, and the way people experience their, their health? And the quality was developed as a common currency for measuring the health benefits of different interventions and across all different types of diseases and conditions. Um, and so the quality really took off in the UK, where it was and it continues to be used to inform decisions about whether new health technologies are cost effective. And many other countries now are also using qualities for similar questions and, and research. So Canada, France, Japan, Australia all use the qualities in this process of health technology assessment, where they evaluate how many qualities a new therapy produces compared to the standard of care. And then also, what is the additional cost of that new therapy? And so this information is used to decide whether the additional benefit of the new therapy is aligned with its additional cost. And if it's not, then those countries or the payers in the countries enter into negotiations with the drug manufacturer to try to align the cost of the drug with its health benefit. And that health benefit is usually measured using qualities. So having this standard metric is obviously very useful, but to simplify the complexities of life and mortality and morbidity into a number is sure to be controversial. Um, why did you, in this work that you published with us, feel it was important to understand the arguments that the detractors of the quality concept uh, tend to use. So this work was really motivated by the current debates that are occurring about drug pricing and how best to have affordable and accessible drugs. So we know that drug spending is a problem. The U.S. is spending more than any other country on drugs, both by volume and unit price. And everyone left, right and center is currently talking about how do we address the spending problem and the high costs. You know, recently, the Biden administration announced that it was interested in having Medicare negotiate drug prices. And if we are going to negotiate drug prices, then we need something to base our negotiations on. And many people, myself included, believe that the basis of that should be what is the value that these drugs are providing to patients uh, and to health systems. And the quality is a tool for measuring that value. And as I said, many countries are already using the quality to do just this. But the quality has a rocky history in the U.S. So the Affordable Care Act limited the use of the quality in Medicare. And there are bills in some state legislatures right now pending that would limit the use of the quality. And in the past few years, I've been reading and hearing criticisms of the quality. And some of them seem to just get things wrong about the quality. And others are really interesting and legitimate. And if we're going to be using a measure or any outcome measure for our policy making, then we ought to understand it. We ought to understand its strengths and weaknesses. And I wanted to dig into the criticisms and understand what is the nature of the criticism of the quality? Um, is it about how it's used? Is it, about, is it about how it's measured? Is it a problem about what we're not measuring? Um, and it's only by understanding that problem that we can address solutions to it and that policymakers can think about what they're trying to achieve with healthcare pricing, with drug pricing and negotiation, what the quality might offer, and, and where there are broader questions that are you know, social or ethical questions about how we want to structure our healthcare spending. Well, that sounds like an important endeavor. So just begin with how did you 
compile what these arguments are. The arguments come up in so many different contexts, in so many different environments. As, as you said, they, they get raised in every discussion about uh, anything that could limit access or, or affect the price. So how, how do you find out and take a systematic approach to, to cataloging these criticisms? We performed a literature review of peer-reviewed articles, and the choice of focusing on the peer-reviewed literature was to try to step back from some of the uh, political debate around qualities and drug pricing. And we chose to use PubMed for this because the aim was to get the, the full range of arguments rather than to drill down into the details and nuance of specific criticisms. And we included uh, in the paper, in the study, any paper that made an argument or identified an argument against qualies. And we really tried to focus in on problems with the quality itself. So papers that were addressing broader issues of using cost effectiveness analysis or why any sort of drug price reduction would be a problem or cost effectiveness analysis shouldn't be used in policymaking were excluded if they didn't specifically talk about the quality. Uh, and once we had our full study sample of 88 articles, we read each one and picked out the criticisms that were being made. And then we were grouped similar ideas together, and then further classified those into types and subtypes of argument and criticism. Well, I'm really eager to hear what you learned. Uh, we'll talk about that after we take a short break. Perinatal mental health issues, including perinatal depression and other mood disorders, affect many individuals in the U.S. and globally and can lead to harm to birthing people and children. The October issue of Health Affairs features a cluster of papers on this important topic. It covers issues such as screening and access to treatment, health equity, and policy opportunities. Check the show notes to order your copy today. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Leah Rand about qualies and how people criticize their use and how a better understanding of those critiques can potentially lead to a path forward for some sort of value-based purchasing or pricing. Before the break, uh, you described how you did the systematic approach to the literature. Let's start talking about the findings. Um, what are the major categories of arguments that you found against the use of the quality? We identified nine types of criticisms, and those fall into three broader categories. So first were criticisms made about the methods that are used to calculate qualities. How are they being measured? What are the components of them and, and the validity or reliability of those measurements? The second category of criticisms are about the neutrality of qualities, that they're neutral and that they ignore certain features of the populations and the patient populations who are benefiting. And then the third category is the claim that qualities are discriminatory or have the potential to be discriminatory. So first off, looking at these methodological concerns with the quality and how it's calculated. One of the main concerns in this category is about the utility scores and how those are derived. Um, so for example, some of the criticisms are around the fact that people who've experienced a health state uh, tend to rate it more highly than people who haven't experienced it. And there are a lot of theories about this, why, why this might be, like adapting to health states, um, but certainly affects some of the underlying assumptions about the quality or how we value our different health states. And, and I'm sorry, I just want to jump in because this seems really important. Mm -hmm. um, what you're saying is that if you ask me in full health, to rate what I think my life would be like if I had a certain impairment, I'm going to probably rate it worse than someone who actually has that impairment. And so if you're using sort of this broad population sample, you're going to undervalue lives that have some impairment. Is that, I just want to make sure I'm getting that right. Yes. So you're right in that because you haven't experienced the impairment, you probably think it's a lot worse to live that way than the person who has that impairment and has adapted to it or experienced life with it. Um, I want to push back about the way we talk about undervaluing those lives, right? Because with the quality, it's really important to think about it as uh, 
being used to kind of set measurements of health and health gain. So when researchers are using qualities, they're not interested in like what that end state final outcome is. Oh, you only got to a utility rating of 0.8. We're interested in what's the difference? How much more health were you able to achieve with this treatment. So this patient population moved from 0.6 to 0.8 in its utility scores, and that that's a good health gain. Um, so there are many different debates about whether we should be using patient uh, utilities or public utilities. And it might be that sometimes we want to use patient utilities to understand the patient perspective a little more closely. And then other people argue, well, when we're making public policy decisions, we're talking about insurance value, which means we care, it's spread out throughout the population and we should be looking at this broader population view of how health is valued, what people are willing to uh, the, the value people assign to these to these different health states, and also that we all have our own health histories and are coming into utility measurement or stating these preferences with that background experience that we've experienced or we've seen someone else experience. So maybe it's a little harder to uh, clearly divide uh, between these different utility preferences and people's experiences. That's very helpful. Okay, keep going. I interrupted your flow. Not at all. No worries. So the next major criticism of qualies or the category that we found is this idea of quality neutrality. And there's a saying among some health economists that a quality is a quality is a quality, which means that all qualities have equal value. And as a side note, they're quick to point out that doesn't mean that each person values a quality equally, but that uh, we qualities are neutral as to who benefit. And what's seen as a feature of the quality in its design, that it's the quality is equal and it ignores the distribution of health, is also seen as a bug. It ignores the distribution of health. It's not telling us anything about who benefits. Um, so a great example of this is the issue of severity. So if a condition is being treated and we can say, oh, this treatment has produced a change in, of 0.2 in the utility scores over the course of the year, it's added 0.2 qualities. We don't know anything about where those patient populations started. Were they in a very poor health state and their utilities were moved from 0.2 to 0.4? Or were they a little better off and they were moved from 0.7 to 0.9? If we just look at the quality gain, we don't know about the severity. And many people think there's an ethical duty to prioritize or help those who are worst off. And there's a lot of polling that shows the public generally prioritizes health gains for people who are worse off, um, but the quality is ignoring that. There's a similar type of argument that happens with health equity, that people have experienced disadvantages. Um, social determinants of health have played into their current health state, and the quality isn't capturing that at all. It's only looking at the health gain from this particular intervention, and we should be more alert to the distribution of health. The final third category of criticisms we identified, and these are the ones that come up the most in the political debates about the quality, is that the quality has the potential to discriminate against some populations. Uh, so these pick up features both about the methods of how qualities are calculated and some of the neutrality concerns. So one form of this is concerns about ageism. So if we're looking at time, then older populations will have fewer years of life they can gain just because of life expectancy. And so that looks like it could discriminate discriminate against them. But there are also people who argue that because qualities don't consider when in someone's life cycle their health benefit happens, really we should be attuned to uh, making sure that everyone can achieve an equal opportunity at having a longer life. So we should care more about long or life gains for people who are younger. And the quality, again, isn't going to tell us when that's happening. Um, and then the second discrimination criticism is the potential for qualities to discriminate against people with disabilities or chronic conditions. And that's because the disability or chronic condition health state has a lower utility score assigned to it. So all else being equal, an intervention that extends life will produce more qualities for people who have a higher utility score rating, say one for full health, than for people who have this lower baseline utility score rating because of a disability disability or chronic condition. So I'm not going to ask you to sort of rebut every criticism that's beyond the scope of either what anyone should be expected to do or what you are trying to do in the paper. But what conclusions do you draw? This this characterization and segmentation of the 
types of criticism is incredibly valuable. Um, when you look at it as a whole, how do you react to these types of criticism? I think there are two main types of responses we should be thinking about. One of them is around the methods and refining or making better the quality. So it was very heartening in doing this research that many of the methods criticisms were coming from papers that were saying, here's a problem with qualities and here's our study trying to improve it. Here's you know, a better utility set or a more sensitive health state measure. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's being done to try and make the quality better, as well as proposals of measures that are quality-like, but uh, maybe solve some of the, the methods problems. Like there's one called health years in total that's being discussed as an, as an alternative. The other main way to respond to these is to think about which of these criticisms are pointing to ethical problems, or social problems that the quality can't resolve. The quality is there to measure health. And as a society, we need to think about, do we value health gains for some patient populations more than others because of severity of disease or when in life they happen or because they allow people to return to work or complete their educations? And that's not something that we can measure as an outcome measure. That's something that requires uh, social and political decision making. And then, of course, when we think about these concerns around discrimination, they, they intersect both of these uh, considerations. So on one hand, we can make methodological changes. So uh, many HTA organizations in other countries. And, and also, HTA, just uh, so our listeners know, health technology assessment. Yes. So many of these health technology assessment organizations in the U.S. and especially in other countries um, do is what's called a sensitivity analysis. So they look at qualities and then they also look at equal value life years gained or just simply the life years gained due to an intervention. And that's looking at life extension without waiting it for quality of life. And that allows us to identify like is baseline quality of life having an impact on how we're uh, measuring health gain. Um, but there's also going to be this inherent tension in if, we, if anyone claims that measuring quality of life is always going to discriminate against those who have disabilities or would have what's seen as like a lower quali health-related quality of life, quality of life is really important. And a lot of drugs address quality of life and they're improving quality of life. So when we use health technology assessment and then qualities as an outcome measure in it, we want to understand what effects on quality of life a drug is having and then assign worth and value to the drug because of those effects. Um, so there's I think it's important to think about qualities as making population level decisions, right? No one's using them for clinical guidance or helping patients pick which treatment course to pursue. They're really for these broader population level decisions um, about things like how much, what should be the list price of this drug or how do we invest our healthcare resources um, and, and what are the trade-offs when we make those investments. So that seems like a really important place to take this conversation, which is that this isn't about using this number to determine my treatment. It's to determine resource allocation at a societal level or at a health plan level or something like that. And there are implicit trade-offs and the quality makes them explicit. And not everyone likes explicit trade-offs, but if they aren't explicit, you're relying on ones that are implicit. So in the conclusion of your paper, you make this statement. I'd love to hear a little more about it. You said, if the implicit principles guiding the status quo of current healthcare policy were made as explicit as they are for the quality, we might find them equally or more inequitable. What did you mean by that? And why do you think that's a true statement? So this idea comes from an article by Jack Dowie. And there's a lot of criticism directed at qualities because we can see what the quality is doing. There's this robust literature on it. 
But we also need to be interrogating the health system and the decades of policy that have gotten us to where we currently are and the inequities that are built in. So for example, right now, drug price negotiations are occurring between manufacturers and pharmacy benefit managers or insurers, and they're based on incentives to those payers and on the business side of things, not based on incentives around patient health when they're negotiating prices. Um, or we consider that drug manufacturers are granted a state monopoly through patents and exclusivities to make drugs and freely set prices. Um, and so we're relying on these underlying implicit assumptions about markets and uh, free trade, but that's creating all of these inequities. And we could see qualities instead as a tool to help us arrive at a fairer system in which we're focused on access, affordability, and aligning costs with the value that the good is providing to patients. So as I read the paper and as I listen to you, it sounds to me like you feel that whatever the shortcomings, the quality does have a role and that part of the reason you did this analysis was to be able to understand and characterize the shortcomings, but also to address them. So I guess I would just close our conversation by asking, if you are generally a believer in the concept, what is the appropriate role? It's not the only factor. So what is the appropriate role of using the quality as we're discussing resource allocation and cost effectiveness? So yes, obviously, I believe qualities can be a very useful tool in cost effectiveness analysis. And it's important to think about cost effectiveness analysis in the context in which it occurs. So all of these health technology assessment organizations in other countries, the ones that are doing these studies in the US, embed the quality at the qualities and outcome unit that's then used in the cost effectiveness analysis. And the results of that are then part of a deliberative process that looks at what other considerations are at play. Um, some of those neutrality issues, severity, health equity, what else might be going on? What should be considered? Um, what has the quality not measured adequately? So the quality and the cost per quality is never just the straightforward decision. And it's important to think about the quality in this overall process. And part of that is that you know, the quality is often associated with a health maximizing or quality maximizing approach that we want to see how many qualities can we get per dollar. But really what the quality allows us to do is to have an explicit conversation about how we're spending healthcare resources, what type of health gain or the amount of health gain we're getting from them, and to be really explicit about what are the benefits and the burdens of our healthcare spending. Um, and I just want to add as well that we can think about whether it's necessary to use qualities for the type of decision that's being made. So if an insurer wants to have a formulary, uh, drug formulary with tiered co-pays based on cost effectiveness, they could just look at the drugs for a specific condition and pick which outcome measure is the most relevant for that condition and will base our cost effectiveness on how the cost effectiveness for achieving that particular outcome. So maybe it's life extension. Uh, but as soon as you want to start to incorporate other considerations, like what about the side effects or how it interacts with you know, whether people are able to return to work better when they take this drug versus that drug, then we need some other measure that's going to be composite and consider both quantity and quality of life. And so, so that's the role that quality has. I think uh, you finish us out with a really important point, which is that the quality is never used alone. And it may be that the criticism lobbed at the quality is as much a criticism of a hypothetical way of using it as it is at the concept itself and grounding our understanding of the, the term and how it's used in the real world in these technology assessment activities uh, is an important corrective to some of the more extreme statements that may be made about uh, what the implications of using qualities are. Does that seem about right to you? That sounds exactly right. Thank you for putting it so well, Alan. <laughs> well, I only did it based on uh, your words. So Dr. Rand, thank you so much for uh, this very important paper and very uh, thorough explanation of what the concept is, what some of the challenges are in using it, um, and the importance of finding some way to standardize our thinking 
acknowledging it will be controversial. But otherwise, as you say, we're just sort of left to processes that may be far more opaque. Uh, Dr. Rand, thank you for being my guest today on A Health Policy. Thank you, Ellen. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And I also want to thank my co-author, Dr. Aaron Kesselheim, and the three anonymous reviewers and editorial team at Health Affairs who really strengthened the article. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about A Health Policy. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Policy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.